In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Once upon a time, in a kingdom on the other side of the world from ours, about two and a half thousand years ago, a king woke from a restless sleep. In his dreams, he had seen a seed fall from the sky. It split in half as it fell. One half landed on solid ground, the other in a dirty marsh. As he watched in his dream, the one that fell on the dry ground grew into a mighty tree that sheltered many animals and provided wonderful shade for children to play in. Over time, however, the tree grew old. The branches began to rot and fall off, and the leaves came off. Finally, an axe man came in the dream and chopped it down and carried it off in a cart for firewood. The other seed, the one that landed in the dirty marsh, grew into a beautiful flower, a lotus. Soon other lotuses sprang up floating on the surface of that dirty marsh. He woke from his dream. In the morning, his wife told him that she had also been woken by something in the night, a quickening in her belly, the beginnings of their child. He realized the two things were probably connected and called his soothsayers to interpret the dreams. They said to him, O mighty king, we have studied the stars and we have looked in the books of prophecy, and we have determined that the child who is to be born will be either a great king a mighty one to unite many nations under your banner, or who will be a great spiritual teacher who will enlighten the minds of many, but be poor his entire life. The king thought on this for a while, and he decided on the path that he would go. He would shelter this boy and protect him from all things that might, he, he might experience of hardship in his life so that he would be a mighty king. He would have the best teachers, the best tutors, the best uh, teachers of swordplay. So if the child grew up, this is what he had. He was kept within the... the uh, the confines of their kingdom's palace, and taught all manner of manly arts and sciences. But, of course, he came of age. And as he did so, his father realized that he should go forth from the walls and begin to see the kingdom he was to rule. So he summoned his best warrior and his wisest counselor, and he said, Take my son on a tour of his kingdom so that he may see what he is to rule. They did. They set off from the the gates, and immediately as they went out, they encountered... Uh, an old man who was struggling with a load on a cart. The boy was shocked. He said, Who is this? What is this? What is wrong with this man? His skin is wrinkled. The counselor said, Oh, my young lord, this man is old. All things grow old and fall apart. Soon he will die. It is the manner of all things. Oh, said the boy, surprised. They went a little further toward the city gate, and as they did so, they found a sick man by the side of the road. He had horrible sores on his arms from leprosy, and the boy said, What is wrong with him? The counselor said, Oh, my child, he is sick. Soon he will die. It is the way of all things. Oh, I see, said the boy. When they passed through the city gate and came to the river that surrounded the town on three sides, they saw upstream from where the women washed their clothes, men creating a pile of wood as tall as a man and twice as wide on each side. As the boy watched from his horse, he saw them take a shrouded body and put it on top of the the pile of wood. As they did so, the linen slipped a little and he saw a foot and he was surprised to realize that there was someone in there. He asked the counselor, what is the meaning of this? The counselor said, oh, my young lord, this person has died. His family is preparing for his funeral pyre. Death, said the boy in a voice so loud that his horse was startled. I see. He was taken back to the palace where he brooded on these things that he had seen on his first trip outside the palace walls. His whole life had been full of the pleasures of of the palace, everything that a rich king could afford for his first son. But he thought and he brooded. After a few weeks, he set off on a journey. He left everything he knew behind, and he went to seek the truth. Eventually, after following several teachers, he sat under a tree, a Bodhi tree, and he meditated, and he came up with a solution. He decided that all life is suffering. And the solution to that suffering, the solution to that suffering, is to withdraw from the universe to become detached from all things. 
This is, of course, the story of the Buddha. The Buddha realized that in the face of suffering, his response would be a sort of withdrawal from the karmic cycle of life and death. About two and a half thousand years later, I was in that same kingdom myself, traveling, uh, trekking through the wilderness, and I got separated from my group. This is a story I've told before. I got separated from my group, but I had a compass and a map, and I understood how to read it. And so I actually unintentionally took a shortcut ahead of my group, but I didn't know it at the time. I was looking for a particular village, and I would ask people on the trail, you know, how far is this village? And they would say, oh, not far, not far. But in, in Nepal, when you say not far, people mean like a three days walk. <laughs> so I kept walking, and night was starting to fall, and I was starting to get scared, so I was walking faster. And I kept seeing footprints of western boots, though, in the mud, so I knew that there was, my group was ahead of me, or so I thought. Eventually, after nightfall, I came to a village, and I heard a voice out of the darkness say, is that Tay Moss? It was another group but belonged to the same school, but it was a different group entirely. I had actually gone, you know, a day's march ahead of my, my uh, previous group. I was exhausted and chafed and tired and, and, and hungry. So I said, the first thing I said was, feed me. So they brought me some, some dal bot, which is this uh, rice and lentil mixture, and I just wolfed it down, and it was delicious. They also gave me some milk tea, which I also greedily consumed. The next thing I said was, take me to the river. All right. So one of the guys took me down to the river, and in that place there was a little eddy, and it made the currents made for very, very soft, silty sand. And I stripped off my clothes and left them with my friend and started to wade into the water, and it was cool and refreshing and felt good against my aching muscles. In the distance down the river valley, I could see lightning flashing, and it was lighting up the rim of the valley, and, and, I, could, and I just floated there in the water looking up at the stars, feeling incredible gratitude, incredible joy of being alive. Uh, incredible pleasure in the feeling of that cold water in my full tummy. My response to the suffering was gratitude. But what's interesting to me is that both the detachment of the Buddha and the gratitude that I felt that day are actually responses to the same reality. They are both the response to true apprehension, true seeing, that when we see the world for what it is, its pains and its pleasures, we simultaneously have both reactions. The withdrawal of detachment and the engagement of gratitude. They are two sides of the same coin, two moments of the same spiritual life. The seeming contradiction, I think, can be resolved with one simple gesture. That is the gesture of openness. You see me when I do the Eucharistic prayers in this gesture. It's called the Oran's position, which is just a Latin word. But it's a gesture of openness. It's a gesture of openness to whatever God may give us. The Buddha in statues is actually depicted with a similar gesture. Often he has his hand out. You see similar gestures when you look at icons of the saints painted through the ages by Christian mystics. There is something about the openness to whatever God's grace that may give us that is holy and divine. And I believe creates both uh, responses of detachment and thankfulness. That posture of welcome and openness How do we get there? I believe we must cultivate an attitude of gratitude. And it rhymes, so it must be true. (laughs) An attitude of gratitude. That there is, as we are open to whatever life may bring, both a joy and attachment. That we can experience the best meal of our lives, perhaps at Thanksgiving. And the next day, know that we're back to pizza and french fries. There is, in the joy of that feast, though, as much pleasure as possible. Three simple practices that can help us get this, this uh, cultivate this attitude of gratitude. One, really simple practical thing, saying grace at meals. Uh, this is an old and venerable tradition in many different, uh, many different religious traditions. It is simply saying thank you for the blessings that we receive, for the food that is on our table, no matter how uh, rich it may be or, or how humble or how small. So saying grace at meals. Second, Looking for the good in all situations. Um, You may know somebody in your life who seems to always be able to look on the bright side of things. Uh, It it is a wonderful practice, and it can relieve you of many anxieties and worries. For example, uh, the historic Buddha, uh, he was actually killed by food poisoning. Uh, He was having a meal with a friend of his who accidentally served him poisonous food. And as he was dying, his friend was distraught. I mean, he just killed the Buddha, right? And he's distraught, and he's saying, Oh my God, I'm so sorry, my Lord. And the Buddha said, No, no, don't be, don't be upset. Uh, you've given me the second most memorable meal in my life. Uh, the, the first was when 
I became enlightened and I had my first meal after fasting for a month. The second is this one, which will surely kill me. <laughs> he saw the good in it. He saw the good in it. In fact, in almost every situation, you can see some sort of a positive thing. If nothing else, you see an opportunity to practice virtue. The virtues of patience, the virtues of endurance, the virtues of faithfulness. If nothing else, you see that. The third practice, simply letting go. Letting the moment be what it is, and then letting it pass away. And not trying to hold on to it, but merely remembering it. I think one of the problems people have sometimes in their lives when they go off track is when they try to repeat something that was really great in their lives, and they, they try to cling on to it and preserve it and make it happen again and again, and it, it's never quite as satisfying as it was that first time, that first blush of experience. Because it never will be. Because life is passing. All things are passing away. And the joy that we experience today will be the sorrow tomorrow. So letting go is a third practice essential to cultivating an attitude of gratitude. As we come to Thanksgiving, we come to a moment of bringing families together and of celebrating the harvest and the bounty that God has given us. And it's an excellent opportunity to practice virtue. Because we all know that with Thanksgiving comes house guests. And as Benjamin Franklin said, guests and fish stink after three days. <laughs> there is a reality that when we are confronted by our closest family and friends, there will be some sharpness there. There will be moments of discomfort and opportunities to practice the virtues. The resignation with which people receive their families at times of holiday like Thanksgiving, however, is a model of this kind of resignation that I'm talking about. Because inevitably, no matter how much you despise your cousin, your uncle, your aunt's nephew twice removed who has that horrible bad breath, no matter how much you despise these people, you will nonetheless be able to sit with them and have a meal. You will nonetheless experience some kind of an ability in yourself to find something good in that situation. It may just be the taste of your mom's gravy. But there will be something joyful there, I almost guarantee it. This is a season of Thanksgiving but it's also a season of true apprehension. In the Gospel, Jesus uh, illustrates his thing about not worrying by pointing to nature. He says, you know, look at the lilies of the field, look at the birds of the air, look at these things. As I said, I think the responses of gratitude and detachment are both responses to a true seeing, a true apprehension. And so my prayer for you as a community, as you go forth and enjoy your holiday, is that you too would see truly People as they are, things as they are. Perhaps that gravy is lumping. And perhaps that lumpiness of that gravy is nonetheless delightful because it's mom's. That's my prayer for us as we go forth and celebrate this Thanksgiving season.